Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about, we uh, do a brief survey of third-party Yako tools that you might use when you're doing your builds. So a little bit about myself. I've been working at Garmin since 2009, and we've been using Open Embedded in the Yako project to make marine or boat electronics since about 2016. I'm a member of the Open Embedded Technical Steering Committee, and there's all the ways you can contact me if you are interested in doing so. All right, here's a brief outline of the uh, main topics and tools I'm gonna cover. Um, if the tool you're particularly interested in doesn't show up here, it's not because I excluded it, it's just because I probably didn't know about it. As someone in IRC just pointed out, there's actually a tool in here that I should have included that I didn't. So yeah, maybe I'll hit on that at the end. Okay, so why why cover, why cover this? Um, so I think if you're, doing builds, um, it's very helpful to have uh, education on just what options are out there that are available to you um, and uh, sort of broadening your perspective as to how people might be using the project and things like that, particularly as we uh, have discussions about should there be a layer setup tool in uh, OE core and what should it do and things like that, just knowing all of the options that are out there that people are using or might use uh, is really helpful for that kind of discussion. Uh, very specifically, this presentation is not intended to say that one method is better than another. I think they all have their um, benefits uh, and detriments and things like that. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a basically overview, very quick overview, because I'm covering a lot of stuff and I don't have time to go into detail in all of them. Um, but a very quick overview of, of what is out there and kind of what's the general gist of how they work. Uh, that being said, uh, I, I do have some bias. I will try to be unbiased, but I will have a little bit because I did write Pyrex and Whisk, which are two of the tools that are being discussed here, and I use Get Submodules. So I am familiar with all the tools in this topic, but I am very familiar with these because I wrote them and I use them every day. So uh, that's uh, just so that you know. All right, so the uh, first thing we're gonna talk about is layer source code management. Um, so when we're talking about layer source code management, um, you know, when you start doing a build, you need OE core and Bitbake, or you, you can use Pokey2 or whatever, and you need to pull in other layers, right? And so in order to basically make your thing do some of the things it needs, you generally more, need more than just OE core. Um, and so, how do we pull those layers in? Uh, specifically, we generally prefer to pull in the actual Git repositories that constitute those layers uh, because that's just a lot easier to deal with. Um, and then when we pull in those layers, how easy is it for us to pull in new versions of those layers so that we can uh, try out the new changes and uh, basically pull in the changes from upstream so we're always up to date. And then also, uh, how easy is it to push changes back upstream? Because you know we should be upstreaming changes that we make to layers. And so we need to be able to easily upstream our changes back to the layers that we pulled into our project. All right, so the first tool I'm gonna talk about is combo layer. So most people I think probably may or may, probably haven't heard of this, but uh, this is actually a tool that is in OE core. It's, it's quite old, it's been there for quite a while. Uh, and um, it uh, is a script, a Python script that lives in OE core, and it basically pulls a whole bunch of layers together into a new single Git repository. Uh, and it kind of does this by uh, sort of cherry picking all the changes into a new Git repo is kind of the way I like to think about it. It, it basically just copies the change from the source repository as a new change in the uh, destination repository. And it can do things like putting things in specific subdirectories and doing some other manipulations of the sources. So uh, to, if you kind of want to view this graphically, uh, this green repository here in the middle um, is the repository that we're creating from the two, the blue and the orange ones on the outside. Uh, and importantly, the thing that combo layer uh, will do is because it's making a new Git repository from kind of just the contextual changes of the other repositories, it's making brand new SHA-1s. So the SHA-1s that are in the new repository don't 
they correspond to a change in the other repository, but it's not the same SHA-1. So when you use combo layer, you'll see, you'll see links, you'll, you'll see in the commit message, it'll put a little message in that said, this came from this SHA-1 of this other repository, which is kind of where you see the yellow, the yellow arrows is kind of designed to represent that. So if you've ever checked out Pokey and seen those, Pocky and seen those in the uh, commit messages, that's, that's what they're saying is this was made with combo layer and it's referencing this other SHA-1. All right, so talk about Git submodules. Uh, so Git submodules is a tool that is basically integrated into Git. So it's just part of the Git suite. Uh, and it basically pulls in sub repositories into a parent repository as just another Git repository. So you have like your child repository is in a subdirectory and it's just a whole another Git repository. It acts just like any other Git repository. Uh, you can pull and push and clone and all sorts of other, or sorry, pull and push and all sorts of other things. Um, and uh, basically the parent repository just uh, there uh, in a commit in the parent repository, you can say, I need this SHA-1 from the child repository. So you can kind of see that graphically here. We've got the parent repository in blue on the left here. And it has like this commit E down here at the bottom says it needs commit A from that child repository. And then later on that commit H needs commit B from the repository. Um, and you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with submodules like recursion, uh, which gets uh, pretty ridiculous pretty quickly, but you can do it. Um, uh, and uh, it does require, it is built into Git, but it does require extra commands to use it. So, you know, you got to do get submodule, you got to remember to do get submodule update to get your module changes. And, you know, there's a few things like that uh, that you need to do in order to use it. All right, another tool we're going to talk about is get subtrees. Um, this is a really interesting tool that I think probably not a lot of people have heard of, uh, but it's basically this external tool. And unfortunately, this is the best documentation link I could find, um, but I feel like there should be a better one somewhere, but I just couldn't find it. Uh, but it basically pulls in uh, repositories in, into a single Git repo, kind of in the same vein as Combo Layer, but it goes about it in a completely different manner, which is that you actually pull in the... Uh, additional like child repositories that you want as additional remotes into the repository that you're creating. And then you use get subtrees to make a uh, very strange commit that is a merge that merges the two remotes together and additionally does a rename of the repository to a subdirectory. Um, that might say, if you, aren't familiar with the Git model, the way that Git models things. It sounds like, I don't know how that's even possible, uh, but it's Git lets you do this kind of thing because it's Git. Um, <laughs> um, and so uh, the advantage of this here is that you actually get the entire history of the repositories that you're pulling in uh, because you know it's just doing this merge of their actual history into your parent repository. And there's also only one Git repo that you have to clone down. Uh, so users of your repository just need to clone down the one repo and they automatically have everything and all the history of everything. Uh, and then, but you do need to use the submodule tool to uh, merge in new changes if your upstreams change or, or uh, uh, things like that. It also has tools to push things back upstream so it can split apart changes that you've made on your mainline branch so that you can uh, to make commits that will go into uh, the remotes. Uh, so if that sounds interesting or weird and you want to check it out, uh, I, I recommend it. I've used it for a couple of things non yakta related at work, and it definitely solves the problem that uh, uh, it solves an interesting problem. All right, and the last tool is repo. So uh, this one is maintained by Google, I think, pretty much. Um, and it's very used very heavily in Android. <clears throat> And uh, it's uh, basically you write a, a very explicit manifest file uh, that usually lives in a separate Git repository. And then you have, you tell repo where that is and it goes and pulls that down and then pulls in all the Git repositories that you need into your working directory uh, or whatever. Um, I think it, ha it definitely has some code review integrations that are designed for Garrett. And I think it has some other features that I'm not terribly familiar with, uh, but uh, I know the Android people really like this or use it a lot. So I'm assuming it, is quite capable. 
Uh, and uh, it can track branch heads, which some people will like the floating branch head, uh, but it can also track SHA specific SHA ones of your child repositories if that's what you want to do. Okay, so the next topic we're going to cover is build environment. So when we're talking about build environment, the primary thing that we're talking about is our host build dependencies uh, that you need in order to build, to do Yocto builds. Um, specifically, we're talking about like building across heterogeneous build environments. So you might have different developers using different distributions. Um, you, you might have one developer who ran apt update that day and another one who didn't uh, and things like that. Um, and also if you're trying to share build artifacts between CI and your developers, um, you know, that that's generally a very different environment. So we want something to kind of standardize our build environment so that we can share things and get consistent and reproducible results regardless of where we build. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is build tools and build tools tarball and UniNative. And uh, this UniNative is uh, something that's actually built into OE core. Uh, and basically what it does is it replaces your host C library to be con so that you get a consistent C library across your build hosts, very specifically for your dash native recipes. So what happens is when you build the dash native recipe, uh, it's actually gonna build against UniNative instead of your host C library. And then uh, everyone who uses that same UniNative uh, will be able to use all those native uh, uh, build artifacts. And this is very specifically so that estate can be shared across different build hosts. Uh, it effectively is isolating uh, your native recipes from which host they were built on. And this is actually enabled by default, unless you're in there explicitly disabling it, uh, you, you're probably already using this and may or may not even know it. So the next thing that OE Core provides is Build Tools Tarball. And this is a tarball that basically has all of the host tools required to build. So it's got GCC and bin utils and all sorts of other stuff. And this is actually built as an SDK out of OE Core and uh, published, I believe, on the Octa Project website. Um, and it, it's very simple to use. If you look at the rather long URL up there, it will give you all the directions. Um, and uh, you can actually even build your own your own build tools tarball with your own custom tools if that's what you need uh, in order to do your builds. So between build tools tarball and UniNative, there's actually quite a bit of host isolation that you can get just with OE Core itself without having to uh, look further afield if that's what you're interested in. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can check out those if you're interested in that. Beyond that, uh, usually people start talking about container uh, technologies. So the first one we're going to talk about is crops. So crops is uh, hosted on GitHub there. Um, and it's basically a whole bunch of Docker containers designed to build Yocta projects. And I'm not specifically sure if crops is an official part of, uh, officially maintained by the Yocta project or not, but uh, basically Tim Orling maintains it right now. And I think a few other people, I don't remember who else, I'm sorry one of the maintainers and I didn't mention you. Uh, but yeah, they maintain a whole bunch of different uh, images to uh, do builds on. So they've got Debian and Ubuntu and Fedora and OpenSUSE, I think are the four main ones. Um, and uh, yeah, so th they do publish a whole bunch of different container images. And if you're just in there poking around, it might be a little confusing as to which one you want to use. You probably want to use the pokey container image as it has support for creating a user in the container that matches your user, which is important if you want to share stuff between the container and outside the container. Uh, the, the, the setup and usage of this is actually very simple. You can see that Docker command down there. Uh, we're basically running the container. Uh, it will just run bitbake by default. Uh, and you know you mount in your work dir and things like that. And it kind of just works and does the build. And it's pretty simple. So check that out too. I've used this before. Uh, I've used variants or of the crops containers uh, specifically for building on uh, Kubernetes clusters, and that has worked very well for me. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the next container technology I'm going to talk about is Pyrex. Uh, so this is 
maintained uh, by me. Um, and the idea behind Pyrex is that it more or less transparently redirects your your build commands to run inside of a Ubuntu container. Ubuntu is the only image we support because I, that's the only one I support. <laughs> um, so for example, you still invoke uh, BitBake, whatever it is you want to build, and then Pyrex will, uh, behind the scenes, intercept that you've run that command and then forward it to run inside the container with all of the appropriate environment set up uh, and things mapped and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, it just kind of works inside the container instead of working out instead of running outside the container. Um, there are multiple LTS versions of Ubuntu supported, uh, specifically for running older Yocto releases on newer hosts. So if you need to go all the way back to just for example Yocto 2.2, because I don't know anyone who would be, still be building that, uh, you can do that with crop, uh, not crops. <laughs> you can do it with crops too, probably, uh, but you can do that with Pyrex. Um, and so, yeah, we support all the way back to uh, Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, it has very comprehensive configuration options, which you can interpret as complex configuration options. So I highly recommend reading the README uh, because, uh, yeah, it, there's a lot of things to configure in order to get it uh, to work just the way that it needs to work. All right. So the last topic that we have is configuration management. So the idea behind configuration management is that we need to build n different configurations, for example, different products out of the same code base. So just as an example from my day job, uh, we have uh, 30 or 40, I don't remember what the count's up to now, different Linux products that we're building. Uh, and out of the same sandbox uh, or same uh, Git repository. Uh, and we need our users to be able to select which one that uh, we are going to build or that they want to build. And hopefully they will get the same configuration as the person down the hall who selects that thing to be built, right? So we want that consistent configuration regardless of what you choose to build. Uh, preferably that configuration lives with the code because that's just a lot easier to manage. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things to keep in mind when you're talking about configuration systems is how easy is it to change some your local configuration uh, for experimentation? Because uh, not only do we want people to be able to say, I want to build this thing, uh, but then if they want to change something, like how easy is it for them to do that uh, for like a local build? Uh, so the uh, first tools that we're going to talk about, surprise, surprise, is something supported by OE Core itself, which is a thing called template comp. Template comp. Um, and this is actually built into the OE init build env script that comes in OE Core. Uh, basically, if you set the environment variable template comp uh, to a directory, it will cause OE Core to populate your bblayers.conf and your local.conf files from templates in that directory. Um, importantly, it will only uh, write those files out if they don't already exist. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. I, you know, I point to template comp at a directory and it didn't pull in the local.conf the, there. Um, that's probably because you already had a local comp. Um, so you can kind of see an example of this here. So uh, down here at the bottom, so I list the files that are in that uh, templates directory and you can see bblayers.conf.sample and local.conf.sample. I set this template conf environment variable and then init the OE init build script. It's gonna copy those .sample files to local conf or bblayers.conf uh, in my build directory. Commonly what I've seen people do, if you wanna go down this route, is the sample files are basically just like one or two lines that are require another file that is source controlled, uh, just to make it a little easier. Um, doing it that way helps alleviate some of the won't overwrite files if they already exist because you can make it so when you pull up in the repository to a newer revision, the files that are in the require can change but uh, local comp itself doesn't have to change since it won't get re-initialized uh, automatically unless the user deletes their local comp. Um, so you can check that out uh, if you need to do setup like that. 
All right, the next one we're going to talk about is WISC. This again is maintained by me. Uh, and it basically provides a, a, the ability to define uh, setup and configuration with YAML. Uh, it integrates with Pyrex if you want to. And it basically provides three axes of configuration. So there's the product, the mode, and the site. So the product is the thing you want to build. Uh, the mode is how you want to build it. So for example, we have builds that are for public release, and we have builds that are for internal development, and they have some configuration options that are different between the two of them. And then the last axis is the site, and that's where you're building from. So if you want to have different caching configurations or different mirror configurations for, uh, you know, building on your CI cluster or, you know, building in the office. Uh, we also have a configuration that's just called roaming that basically turns off all of the, uh, you know, estate mirrors and all that. Because if you're, you know, out and about, that's probably not going to work very well. Uh, WISC makes heavy use of multi-config. So basically everything, all the products it defines are their own separate multi-config, which lets you do all sorts of interesting building multiple things at once and sharing things between different builds and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it also supports uh, per product BB layers uh, by using BB mask to mask out layers you don't want if you've configured multiple products with multiple layer combinations that may or may not be incompatible, uh, which helps a lot with some BSPs that aren't behaved very well. Uh, and it has some limited layer customization support uh, ability to apply patches to layers. I think I added that, I don't remember. Uh, basically, and so here's an example of how that looks. So you initialize your build environment down there and you say, you know, I wanna build the Eagle product in release mode and I'm currently at the Olathe site and it'll configure all the stuff for you. And then you can say bit bake all targets, it provides a little convenient uh, bit bake recipe called all targets that basically just builds everything you've configured because one of the things you can do is configure for multiple products simultaneously. All right, and the last thing is cause, which there was a very comprehensive presentation uh, that was just done right before this. So I'm not gonna talk about this too much, uh, but uh, I, I included it here at the end, but as you've kind of seen, like cause basically does all of these things together in one thing. So you can just say cause build project.yaml and you know, you get the layer set up and the, uh, you can do the container builds if you need and you can do the uh, uh, configuration management and all of that together in one thing. All right, so. Uh, in conclusion, I talked a little faster than I was anticipating, so got some time left for questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, there's a lot of tools out there. I would invite you to go check all of these out. Uh, they're, they can all be pretty interesting things to play around with if you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah, they're all, they all have their uses.